to join us in this most auspicious celebration of the 125th anniversary of the birth of SJV Chelvaniadam. The sunshine and warmth after such a long winter are so wonderful to enjoy together. Before we begin our formal program, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. <coughs> For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. Just a few um, housekeeping uh, uh, points and uh, a little bit about the format of today's, um, today's gathering. Um, if you are at the table and are speaking uh, during the moderated portion, you will need to press the button on your microphone for your microphone to turn on. Um, we are uh, videotaping this and it is being live streamed on Facebook and people can access it on the CTC website. Uh, we'll have a few uh, speakers today. Uh, we'll have a musical performance, and then we will have um, uh, two speakers here, uh, followed by uh, a moderated panel. And uh, you'll have plenty of time to ask questions and engage with the panel. So that's just a little bit about uh, how our evening together will unfold. And now, I'd like to welcome Sivan Alonko to the podium. Alonko is the president of the Canadian Tamil Congress, he is also chair of the Toronto Tamil Chair Committee and led the initiative to establish the Chair in Tamil Studies at the University of Toronto Scarborough to great success. He also spearheaded this evening and the program. Please welcome Alonko. Thank you, Lisa. On behalf of the Canadian Tamil Congress, it is my privilege to welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I would also like to express our sincere appreciation to Professor David Cameron and Professor Ashwini Masanda Kumar, Mr. Velu Pulai Panavelu, and MP Ar Gary Ananda Sangari for accepting our invitation to speak today. We are also very thankful to the University of Toronto Scarborough for ongoing partnership and support all along and particularly in hosting today's event. Special thanks to Lisa, Celeste, and Mary for your help and support. I am a little apprehensive about preceding such an eminent scholars and speakers and have given considerable thought to what I have to say. Although SAV is telling lifelong contributions and dedication for Tamil rights are many, including standing up for our country Tamils when they were disfranchised. <clears throat> to be on the safe side, I am going to limit my speech to historical counts of issues impacting Tamil language in Sri Lanka and the contribution of SJV Selmanayam Foundation to the Tamil Chair. Since commencing that Tamil Chair initiative in 2018, we have hosted several cultural events in partnership with the University of Toronto. This, however, is the first memorial lecture, and it happens to be SJV Selenaya Memorial Lecture, which makes us very happy indeed. Following the independence of 1948, the then Prime Minister S.W.R.B. Banda Mayaka introduced in 1956 the Singhal Act in Parliament replacing English with Singhala as the sole official language of Sloan and excluding the oldest living language Tamil. The language of the largest minority group, the Tamils, were excluded as a means of official communication and was effectively one of the first acts of discrimination against Tamil. On June 6, 1956, when Singhala only act bill was being debated in Parliament, the members of the federal party, led by SJP Selvan Ayagam, followed Gandhian principles and staged a non-violent protest or Satyagraha against the imposition of Singhala only bill. The Satyagraha occurred outside of the then parliament on the gorgeous green, 
these peaceful protesters, including many Tamil members of parliament, were beaten up by police and were, some were thrown into a lake near the parliament. I have no wish to repeat the, what occurred over the next number of decades, other than to state that the failure of non-violent Gandhian protests led to armed, armed ethnic conflict and that Tamils were forced to flee from Sri Lanka into welcoming hands of countries such as our new home Canada. Today, Tamils are living in a number of countries, including G7, and the Tamil language has transformed itself into an international language spoken or celebrated 24 hours of the day in some parts of the world. After 60 plus years of exclusion of Tamil language and not given equal status by the passage of Single Only Act, we are now pleased to see the recognition given to our language in prominent universities in the Western world, including these universities. A remarkable transformation for a language that was marginalized in Sri Lanka from 1956 onwards. I also want to share with all of you the significant contribution of the Sermonite on Foundation allowing us to reach the goal of establishing a chair in Tamil studies at the University of Toronto Scarborough. I had requested Maliha Vincent to speak to SJB and our family to provide funds from the foundation for the establishment of Tamil chair. One day, Maliha called me and asked, Lama, how much do you need to reach the goal? When I replied, we required 250000 to meet the $3 million goal. She said, Lama, I can arrange to get it. It was a very proud moment and moving moment for both of us when both of us personally came to the university to hand over the final check of 250,000 to Celeste during the COVID period in 2021. The announcement, announcement by the university on reaching the campaign goal was scheduled for release on April 26, 2021. And by an extraordinary and a fortunate coincidence, Two days before the release, we realized that April 26th is also SJB Selvanayagam death anniversary. I don't think even if we had planned whether we could have arrived at a better date for the announcement, this unplanned honor and recognition is truly appropriate for SJB Selvanayagam, a consistent and devoted defender of rights of Tamil and their language using non-violent means based on Gandhian principles. We understand that the University of Toronto is in the final stage of finalizing the appointment of Tamil chair professor. Once this, once this appointment is announced, we plan to work in collaboration with the, the chair and the university to host many programs and events related to Tamil language and culture. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. Like all of you, I am also looking forward to hear from our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Uwanko. Next, we have Mr. Velu Palai Thangavelu. Mr. Thangavelu is a community leader and a member of the Canadian Tamil Congress. He worked as an accountant and auditor for several years in Sri Lanka, Nigeria, and Canada. <coughs> I am asked to speak on the briefly about my interaction with uh, Sandra Shivanayam. I think there are not too many here in this hall who have interacted with uh, Sandra Shivanayam. But I can see one, is Mira Subramani, who is my friend. He was the uh, general party Salvador in the company. I have seen him speaking at the platform. My election with uh, Kirwanayam came about because of the Signal Only Act. The Signal Only Act was passed in 1956 May, and uh, it criticized the Tamil public servants because the GCSU, which represented the Tamil public service,
ഡോക്ടർ
So it is a matter of principle. They, they are very, very rarely you get a uh, good person on these like the Tanda Sunday. I, for one, you know, I, 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 I love it and I adore him next to my father and uh, father. He was such a very, and he lost his wealth and also his health. What he lost because of his politics. <coughs> when, when, the, when in the 1948, am I taking more time? In, when, uh, when, the, when in the 1948, when the judicial package was passed <coughs> by, the, by the parliament, well, uh, close to 800,000 income returns, they, they, they lost their situation. And it was that which broke the Tamil Congress because Chalanayam refused to uh, support the bill. Although the, the Tamil Congress, uh, majority of the Tamil Congress, they were MP, they decided. At that time, unfortunately, Gigi Bonamor was negotiating for a, a ministry, a minister job. And so he, he is a ministry of job. And uh, Chalana didn't know about it. Only at the time of voting, he walked out, but his other members walked for the uh, for the bill. So that was the cause, that was the reason why he started the Elangate Congress and the federal party. He could have he had choices. He could have he could have gone, get, gone along with Gigi Bonamor, who was a uh, great leader at the time. Or he would have withdrawn and go back to his uh, practice full time, <coughs> where he can earn money. Because his only lawyer at that time was earning 10,000 rupees a month, which is about 10 lakhs now. So he would have done that one. Or he, he could have uh, just given up politics and uh, attack. But he didn't. Do anything like that after deliberation, after thought, he formed the party. That is the elected uh, party, the federal party. So, and as a man, we can't forget him. And next Wednesday, 19th, we are organizing a small event to celebrate the 100 100th birthday of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and that on that day, we are releasing a book. Not releasing a book, I, actually, we are. Uh, publishing, republishing a book, which is called uh, a Shrivicharana uh, Attribute. So, we, we, as long as uh, Tamil people live, as long as the, we all uh, live, we will always remember Shrivicharana for his sacrifice. And nothing, nothing else but for his sacrifice. Thank you. What a great opportunity to hear such a personal um, account of your interactions with uh, Chalda Nayakam and, um, and get a real uh, glimpse into his, his person and his character. Thank you for that. Many of you will uh, recognize our next speaker, Mr. Gary Ananda Sangri. Gary is the Member of Parliament for Scarborough Rouge Park. He also serves as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada. Gary. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to join, join you here this evening. Um, I do want to uh, start off by acknowledging that we're gathered here on the traditional lands many nations, uh, most recently at the Mississauga for the Credit. And I want to uh, first of all pay tribute to the Chalunayan family, represented by Malina and others uh, who are here today. Um, and I want to share with you some reflections um, on the late uh, Mr. Chalunayan. But before that, let me just frame um, using some numbers where we are today. Um, this year marks the 200th anniversary of the indentured Tamil laborers who were brought onto the island. This year also marks the 75th anniversary of the formation of the Sri Lankan, modern Sri Lankan polity, uh, based on <coughs> post-colonial, yet a neo-colonial construct. Uh, this, for us, many of us here, marks the 40th anniversary of Black July, uh, and in Canada, really the, the growth and the spark of the Tamil community uh, in the 
past 40 years. Uh, it is in this context, I think, we're in many ways celebrating um, the, the incredible life and legacy of uh, the late Mr. S.J.B. Chilmanayagam. Um, and I want to just share with you several I mean, key attributes of what his legacy entails. I think first and foremost, um, he had a clarity of what Tamil nationalism needs to be. Uh, and it is based on the notion of the importance of language, the importance of land, the importance of culture, and most importantly, a secular uh, fight. Uh, and I think it was very, very crucial for the foundation of Tamil nationalism that that we saw, and we saw the good, bad, and the ugly over the years of, of what that entails. But I think for many of us, um, the attributes of a secular um, notion of Tamil nationalism, I think, is critical. And as we move forward um, today, I think it's, it's more pronounced than ever. The second aspect I think is, is critical is uh, the notion that um, there is a need for self-determination. And I think there's oftentimes uh, confusion about what self-determination entails. So self-determination is a range, uh, anything ranging from a separate state to um, to a, a very strong federal state to uh, states uh, that are in between, uh, or sometimes even in a unitary structure. But, but the core of self-determination is uh, the ability of a people to essentially um, have control over their affair, their local affair their land, their natural resources, their language, their culture. And, and I know uh, Professor Cameron and, and Professor Smith-Mar will speak about the, the importance um, of that, I think, in, in the context of Canada and, and the lessons that we can take. But I think it's important to recognize that that is ultimately what uh, the Tamil Nationalist Project is. And many of us who um, may not call it uh, as subscribers of that um, are nevertheless, I think, are very much connected to that notion of self-determination. And then I think we may have differences on how uh, that will look like, and, and, and I think that's probably not a bad discussion to have. Um, as we look um, to a structure uh, in Sri Lanka that is now 75 years old, that has consistently failed uh, Tamils, and I would uh, say uh, its minority populations overall, um, I think there's some need for reformulation of the state uh, and a reimagination of what um, that state uh, needs to do uh, for its own survival, let alone um, that of, of the Tamil uh, population. After 17 times going to the IMF for bailout, uh, Sri Lanka is essentially at a crossroads, at a critical juncture where um, it has to own up to some existential threats. And first and foremost is climate change. The conversation, I think, is not really taking place. But even in the Tamil context, it's so critical to, to recognize the impact of climate change on, on the population. But I think more, um, more importantly, I think it's, it's, a, it's time to really face the reality of what kind of a state is it? Is it really progressive? Is it, uh, or, or is it regressing? And I think for the benefit of all of those on the island, there is an absolute need to have uh, a form of uh, political structure that essentially allows and enables self-determination to take place, which will allow for the Tamil language to flourish. And, and I came back from Tamil Nadu on Monday, and I can assure you that Tamil, I, I'm, I was quite disappointed at the, the level of Tamil usage in Tamil Nadu itself, uh, and I think, um, in the northern east of Sri Lanka, at least, I think there's a definite need um, for, for that to, to, to continue and, and for the language to, to flourish. But more importantly is the ability of the, um, the economy, the, the ability of the Tamil population to run the economy. So it, to put it in context, as we were doing some work around IMF, um, in terms of overall GDP output, the North and East represent 4% of uh, the GDP output on an annual basis, compared to about 35% in the South. Um, and I would argue that uh, if you uh, enable um, the North and East to have self-determination of its economy, 
that those numbers would be drastically different and I would, I would dare challenge anyone to, to, to tell us otherwise because right now we do not have control over the land, we don't have control over business development, we don't have control over national resources. So I think that's a critical component for us to, to, to reflect on. Um, and finally, I think the, the world is watching. Uh, we are in an era where there are so many different uh, factors in the region that's, uh, th that's manifesting um, in, in a good and a bad way, uh, but particularly with the influence of China and its interplay with India. Uh, I do think there's an opportunity for, uh, for uh, a reformation that will enable the, the Tamil community to uh, self-determine its, its future. And, and to me, the lessons of uh, HGV Tilanayam is that, that, is that he planted the seed, he uh, nurtured it, uh, he built, and, and, and through um, many of the, the, the stalwarts of the IPAK um, uh, that are here today, Mr. Tangamil um, and others, um, I know that that has continued, but that has also passed generations uh, to a point where in Canada we saw tens and thousands of Tamils protesting uh, in the end of the, um, <coughs> the armed conflict in 2009, but more importantly, they continue to advocate uh, for the rights of the Tamil nation. So with that, I, I want to uh, end off with, uh, with another important legacy, which sometimes I think is overlooked. Um, so I had the privilege of working with uh, Maliha as, uh, um, uh, when she hired me at the Ministry of Labor many, many years ago, um, and then I thought she was an incredible figure at that time, but little did I know that uh, the work of um, Dr. Chandra Hassan, uh, who I was able to meet this week and uh, you know, for the second time, and the incredible um, contribution that he's made um, I don't think it's recognized anywhere, um, anywhere, uh, frankly. Um, he started an organization called Offer, and for the last um, almost 40 years, um, he has supported um, almost 70,000 uh, Tamil refugees who were uh, domiciled in, in South India. Uh, he continues to advocate for them, uh, and one thing that he left, he, he, um, uh, he one, one thing he told me that, that really, I think, uh, uh, captured my heart, he said uh, um, education is something that is, uh, it's the only thing that we can take with us. And I think if we look at the legacy of the Tamil people here or on the island, um, or in terms of the work that he's done with the, re the refugees who are now the second third generation uh, in India, is the uh, imparting uh, education to those generations. So he has fought the Indian government, he's fought the uh, Tamil Nadu government, and, and I would say, I should say, he collaborated uh, in many ways to get things done for his people, which, which I think uh, has gone um, unnoticed, um, unrecognized, but not unnoticed. So, so I think I, I want to pay particular tribute to the work that he's done, and I know many of his other family members do enormous work as well. Uh, but ultimately, the legacy is all of us. Is the the Tamils around the world who are, I would say, uh, united in their effort, united in their resolve uh, to ensure that there's peace, uh, but also to ensure that there's self-determination and a just peace uh, that will enable the Tamil uh, people to continue to, to live, uh, coexist and live in harmony um, with others uh, on the island. So thank you for this opportunity, and, uh, and I look forward to you. Thank you, Gary, for joining us today and for your continued support of BTSC. What is a celebration without music? Uh, please join me in welcoming Vishnavi Shriranjan, uh, a U of T alumni. She completed her double degree in political science and economics and is an active contributor to the Tamil community as a trained and performing vocalist and violinist. Vishnali has learned and been in performing for over 13 years and continues to incorporate her musical journey along with her career and other extracurricular activities.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vaishni, as she already mentioned. I'd like to start off by saying thank you to my local and University of Toronto for providing me this opportunity. It's a pleasure being a UFT alumni and being participating in such an honor, especially an honor to take part for this memorial for the late Mr. SJB Tobin Igum, and I hope you all enjoyed this performance. Thank you.
Thank you, Vaishnavi. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Professor David Cameron to speak, a professor of political science at the University of Toronto in the 1980s and 90s. Professor Cameron served as a senior official both in Ottawa and at Queen's Park. A longtime student of federalism in Canada and internationally, Professor Cameron, Cameron has just published a volume of his essays, The Daily Plebiscite, Federalism, Nationalism, and Canada. Um, from 2013 to 2019, he served as the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science at the University of Toronto. And Professor Cameron is currently Special Advisor to the President of the University. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to, uh, to be here. Uh, I have to admit that uh, when Maria uh, called me out of the blue to suggest this, uh, it was kind of a, a, a rush of experiences from the past that came over me because I haven't uh, been heavily or directly involved with uh, Sri Lanka for a decade and a half now, but I was at one time uh, very intensely involved Indeed, as some of you, uh, as some of you know, um, this event, uh, as we know, is in uh, is to honor S. J. V. Chalmanayakam uh, on the occasion of what would have been his 125th birthday. <coughs> he played very a very special uh, role in Sri Lanka, and there have been some wonderful tributes to him in the remarks that we made uh, previously. Uh, that gave, uh, for me, a real sense of his uh, character and his personality and contribution he made. He was the unquestioned leader of the Tamils from the mid-1940s to his death in 1977, and he was constantly, as I understand his role, constantly searching for ways in which there could be uh, a just accommodation of the Tamil community and other minority groups uh, within Sri Lanka. He stuck fast throughout his career to the principle of nonviolence, despite the fact uh, that his efforts at reform, including federalism, were rejected by successive Sri Lankan governments. So I find that there is a great deal uh, to admire in his leadership, and I'm very happy to join in honoring him this evening. Maybe just a quick word about my experience uh, in Sri Lanka. I worked with uh, Bob Gray. Uh, during the ceasefire agreement, um, and we were back and forth to Sri Lanka a dozen, I don't know how many times, but a lot. Uh, and we're working actually uh, on the government side, with, especially with Gio Paris, um, who is still in politics, if not uh, in ministerial office currently, as I understand it. And we also were working uh, during much of this period with the LTTE itself, and in particular, uh, S.P. Tamil Sheldon and uh, Anton Balasingham. Uh, so it was a very, uh, uh, I think it was a, a kind of dual role that, that if the peace process continued probably couldn't have uh, been extended in quite that form to be in a sense advising both sides to the conflict. But in those early days of the, the ceasefire agreement, um, it, it was possible. And it, for me it was a privilege to get to know a little bit about the country and its people. And I viewed then and I view now the country as a place of, of boundless possibility. I mean, it's just uh, extraordinary what kind of country that could be, um, but one that has tragically squandered its potential. And I think, in my understanding, is that even the opportunity for a new start presented by the defeat of the LTTE, it appears to have been wasted. And the country is now effectively a ward of the International Monetary Fund. So I, uh, it's really with sadness that uh, I kind of review the, the history and the, uh, the, the, the course of events in Sri Lanka. Um, um, and I guess my the thoughts that I'll share with you tonight are somewhat bleak, frankly. Um, I've been asked to talk about federalism in Sri Lanka, uh, and federalism as a possible 
uh, path to a form of peace and reconciliation, or at least detente. And I will do that, uh, and then offer a few uh, concluding uh, observations in a somewhat larger context. So, uh, five points. My first point is that uh, Sri Lanka is not friendly to the, its demography is not friendly to the idea of federalism. So there are real challenges just in the character of the, the composition of the population of the country when one thinks about introducing the federal principle significantly into that, uh, into that country. The Sinhalese, as you know, compose about 75% of the population, and the other ethno-cultural groups are very small by comparison. The, the Sri Lankan Tamils at around 11, and you know all this, but um, I'm rehearsing it. Nevertheless, the Indian Tamils at uh, around 4%, and the, the Moors and the Muslims at about 9 so if you think of creating uh, provinces or subnational states in a federation, provinces like we have in Canada, uh, it's hard to imagine the Sinhalese welcoming the division of the territory on which they live into subnational jurisdictions. Uh, and the Moors aren't really territorially concentrated. The identity and experience of the two Tamil communities are quite different, and they live typically in different parts of the country. So you think about how would you create a federation with, a, with two units maybe, uh, or more, but a two unit federation, a, a tiny Tamil state or province in the north or the northeast, plus a vast uh, Sinhalese dominated state in the rest of the country. Um, that would be, and certainly experience of, of federations elsewhere would suggest that a two unit federation, particularly one of this character, would be highly unstable and likely to replicate many of the same tensions that currently exist in the country. If, what about a multi-unit federation? If so, you have to think through how would the states or provinces actually be um, defined. So that's my first point. The second point is uh, just to observe that uh, federalism is not devolution or decentralization, but a, a, general, a genuine distribution of of real power between different orders of government, as we have, for example, in Canada and in other federations. So federal units in a federation cannot be abolished at the will of the central government. They are there with the same constitutional footing as the central government itself. So units hold genuine constitutional power, and that power will be shaped and established and protected ultimately by uh, courts in allocating jurisdiction and confirming the existence of jurisdiction to either the federal or the provincial or subnational governments. So the United Kingdom, as an example, is decentralized uh, and, and in some respects highly decentralized, but it is not a federal system, at least not yet. Um, in Sri Lanka, to my knowledge, the majority has never been willing to genuinely share power with the other communities in the country, let alone have the central government share power with significant subnational governments. So my third point has to do with what I would call a painful compromise, which I think is at the, at, at the heart of the federal moment quite in many uh, countries. So when uh, you have a hard-fought compromise, uh, which doesn't really please either side, so I think in a, in a way, Federalism is probably almost always a kind of second best choice for uh, communities collectively. But it's the choice that they can make, it's the compromise that they can achieve that allows them uh, as communities to live together in peace and justice. Um, but the dissident region or regions typically would rather secede and become independent states. I mean, you think of the uh, um, the, the, the northern Iraq, clearly the, the members of the Kurdish community in northern Iraq would much rather be separate, but they were not, that was not permitted by the international community, so they've made the most of what they can do. They've had a, a, signif they had a significant and quite powerful regional government uh, within, with, but within Iraq itself. So, you know, on the one hand you have a the, the uh, usually minority group or the dissident uh, region uh, preferring separation but not being able to get it. 
Um, and on the other hand, you have a central government that would rather retain all the power and remain a unitary uh, dominant uh, entity, but it can't get away with that either. Uh, in these circumstances, there's a kind of painful accommodation federalism. That's often the way in which these, <coughs> these structures appear. But obviously, for this to happen, uh, whatever pain that goes into it, there has to be uh, an honest willingness to compromise. And the Sinhalese, through the national government, uh, won the Civil War, and on the evidence, as far as I understand it, don't really feel the need to compromise. And this makes it very difficult to make progress uh, on constitutional issues and in terms of repairing the, the destruction that has been visited on particularly the minority communities in that country. Uh, my fourth point is, is, I would say that what you might call coming together federalism is quite different from coming apart federalism. Uh, the coming together version is where previously separate or autonomous units decide to enter into federal association for defense purposes or uh, for economic advantage, there are a variety of possibilities. So if you think of the United States or Canada or Australia, that was a dominant force or factor in explaining the emergence of the federal system in, in those countries. Uh, coming apart federalism is where you would have multiple units being created out of a unitary form of government. Um, and, and examples of that would be Belgium, Spain, Iraq. Um, so coming together is, I think, pretty clearly an easier proposition to accomplish than coming apart. Uh, it feels as if you are positively building something, uh, whereas the other one feels sometimes, at least for some significant members of the community, it feels like taking things apart. So uh, coming apart, though, federalism is what Sri Lanka would be doing if it actually constructed this uh, form of government. And it's pretty obvious to see that for the Sinhalese in particular, it would feel like a failure and a loss. Uh, because unless they, that community reshaped its, its identity radically, uh, in terms of what Sri Lanka as a country means to them, uh, and it, it starts to mean that it's something other than simply a Sinhalese nation dominant on that island, then the, the foundation on which this is likely to happen is not really there. Um, my fifth point is uh, that it's, I've really been struck by this in the work I've done internationally, that it's really difficult to get the logic of federalism. So if uh, people have never experienced life in a federal system, they find it really difficult. I mean, honestly, I'm not, it's not that they're obtuse, but you just don't get, you don't get the logic of the federal system if you haven't had some experience of it, uh, of the fact that you need to show restraint, uh, that there's a requirement of a degree of trust, if not in nothing else, at least in the courts, to protect the various uh, federal units. Uh, that the notion of genuine sovereign, po sovereign power is distributed between the central government and the various regions. That's very hard for people to uh, conceive of when they're used to uh, a pinnacle of power at the central government level which holds ultimate sovereignty. And that's clear and simple. It may be just or unjust, but it's intelligible. But in a federal system, I mean, scholars at one point were having uh, discussions about, well, where is sovereignty? Where is sovereignty actually located in the federal system? And it's a very hard question to answer. It's not in the central government. It's not in the provincial governments. Some people say, well, it's in the courts, but it's not in the courts or the constitution. So it, by design, it distributes real political power. And I think people who are living in unitary systems find that very hard to actually understand. How does this work? How does it actually function? Uh, we all know because we live here. So those are my five points. I'll just uh, I'll turn now to uh, uh, a discussion of the federalism in a somewhat different context. I think I've, I hope I've done my duty because I was asked to talk about federalism and not, I have. Um, 
the Queen. The Queen. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd like to uh, make a distinction between um, uh, political institutions on the one hand and political culture. So institutions are things like the courts, the legislature, parliament, political parties, the electoral system, the constitution itself, and the federal system if the country is in fact a federation. So those are institutions. Political culture is the attitudes, the norms, the values, the beliefs that uh, citizens hold about politics uh, and about their political community. So you can think of political institutions in a way as the hardware and the political culture as the software. And my point is that there needs to be an alignment between the hardware and the software in a country. So if people don't, for example, accept the authority of courts, uh, if that's not part of their political culture to, to revere courts and obey the consequences of court decisions, then it'll be impossible for the courts to do their work and to do justice. Citizens will not obey judicial decisions. Police will not enforce them the legislatures will not respect them. If corruption is rampant among citizens and civil society and in the economy, then don't expect a clean bureaucracy. It's very hard to have these two misaligned functioning together. Uh, equally, if the government and the civil service are corrupt, it fosters practices of corruption uh, throughout the society and throughout the economy. And with respect to federalism, uh, if you want to establish a, a successful, effective federal system of government, there needs to be what you might call uh, a federal people, um, a population that accepts and respects diversity, which has some skill in the art of compromise, because compromise is at the heart of federalism. The operation of a federal system is not pretty. And it's all kinds of deals and arrangements and knocking off the edges of what you really hope to get and so on. Uh, so compromise is at the center of a, a properly functioning federal system. Um, you need to have a, a population which believes in constitutional government, where the rule of law is, ex is accepted as generally authoritative and certainly binding, uh, and where limits and constraints uh, are, are recognized as necessary for the proper functioning of the state. So I'd suggest, uh, unless things have changed radically since I was familiar with on you know, a day-to-day -day basis with Sri Lanka, that these qualities have been in short supply there. But to my knowledge, there's never been a real reckoning to explain what went so appallingly wrong in the country over generations and what it would take to make things right. And in the absence of such a process, unspeakably difficult uh, though it is, I find it hard to imagine that the conditions for the successful introduction of some sort of federal system uh, exist. The majority has to be prepared to make the accommodations and compromises necessary uh, to give the minorities a sense of security and a feeling that they're being treated fairly in the country. Has that happened? I, I don't think so. President uh, Radio Rick Ramasinghe uh, promised in January of this year the full implementation of the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, and as you know, that provides for provincial councils and a degree of decentralization and administrative, not federalism, but a degree of administrative decentralization. That was, that was passed in 1987, so 36 years ago and it's never been fully implemented. Uh, he promises he's going to do that finally, but in the same report I was reading, uh, it reports that um, the National Freedom Front, which is part of the FPA, declared that patriotic Sri Lankans are ready to defeat the full implementation of this amendment, even at the expense of their lives. So, it shows you that even today, after all that Sri Lanka has gone through, little seems to have changed. And, and this, is a, this is an administrative arrangement, fundamentally, it gives 
just a degree of, of self-government and control to various parts of the country, but in particular to allow the minorities in the country to have some place and character in the scheme of things. So I said at the outset that my remarks would be bleak. If that's the case, it's not really because the prospects for federalism as such are poor, though that I think they are, but because the conditions for establishing a, a just political system, genuinely accommodating of, of minorities, whether federal or not, seems woefully absent. Federalism is an instrument for achieving certain ends fundamentally. People don't typically uh, you know, die for federalism or go to war for federalism. It's not, it is, it's a governing instrument. It's a way of organizing yourself as, as a complex society so that everybody has a pretty good place in it and pretty good opportunities to flourish, both individually and communally. Um, so, but it's not an end in itself. The end is missing. Uh, and crucial in my opinion, and that is some form of, of justice and equal opportunity for all the communities of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cameron. Um, next chair, we have Ms. Ashwini Vasanthakumar. Ms. Vasanthakumar is an associate professor and Queen's National Scholar in Legal and Political Philosophy at Queen's in Canada. She holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard, law degree from Yale, and a PhD from Oxford, where she studied as a Canadian Rhodes Scholar. Ms. Basin Zakumar's first book, The Ethics of Exile, was published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Her research currently focuses on oppression and resistance Transitional Justice and the Ethics of Migration. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you very much uh, to CPC and to Ms. Malika Wilson for the generous invitation to speak for you today. Uh, and thank you all for sort of staying awake uh, during all of these conversations. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to be, uh, well, I don't, well, I'll try to be brief, uh, but that's probably not a promise I'll keep. Um, so I was born a few years after SJP Chelten Eichmann's death, so I belong to the generations that inherited his political legacy, but wander around to witness the creation of it. So in preparing for today's uh, events, I went back to read some of Mr. Chelten Eichmann's early speeches and political writings. I wanted to get a sense of what his key political commitments and values were, how he saw the predicament of Tamils and minorities in Sri Lanka, uh, and how this might help us, or at least help me, reflect on ways of thinking for, uh, of the way forward. Um, so I should introduce the caveat that this is an interpretation. Uh, I can't guarantee that if Mr. Chalbanakam was at the table, he would agree with anything I'm saying. Um, but I hope that he would at least appreciate that um, some of his ideas at least, uh, you know, continue to have this kind of relevance. So there are two th key themes that I really want to highlight from his political thought that at least really resonated with me. Um, the first was a vision of a progressive and pluralistic Tamil nationalism. So earlier, Gary alluded to the fact that Tamil nationalism can take many forms. Uh, and I really was struck by uh, some of the aspects of nationalism that Mr. Chalda and I um, advanced. Um, and the second sort of key element is thinking about principled pragmatism. So thinking of politics as a dance between principle and strategy, um, and the way in which you might try to strike that balance. So Mr. Chalda and I, um, as others have already said, had an enduring commitment to Tamil self-determination, and help to give voice to a growing political consciousness. He repeatedly reaffirmed, and the Tamil people re repeatedly reaffirmed, that they had a distinct political identity and aspired to self-determination. But Mr. Chalda Nayakam's nationalism was not exclusionary or chauvinistic. If Tamil nationalism partly arose as a reaction to Singhala Buddhist chauvinism and aggression, 
Then Mr. Chubb and I again seemed committed to making sure that common nationalism would not mirror this kind of chauvinism. First, Mr. Chubb and I again recognized the right of self-determination of other communities and minorities in Sri Lanka, especially Muslims and Hill Country Tamils. He repeatedly urged that these were distinct and equal communities with whom Tamils could make common cause and act in solidarity against the common threat, which was similar to this majoritarianism. Second, he also recognized the inherent pluralism within the Tamil community. The Tamils could come from different religious communities, uh, from different class backgrounds, that they might embrace different political ideologies, but that they were still a part of this self-constituting Tamil political community that was committed to Tamil self-determination. So even if there is a lot of dissent and disagreement between Tamils, that they were still a part of the same unit. And finally, I think his progressive nationalism meant that he recognized that freedom for Tamil people required what he called social freedom for all Tamils, including and especially those groups who are oppressed or marginalized within the Tamil community. So even though I think nationalism, and especially the nationalism that we're seeing on offer these days across the world, is often really exclusionary, um, violent, uh, unpleasant and unwelcoming. I think when you sift through some of the early readings and writings of, of Mr. Chauvinism, you see the possibility of a Tamil nationalism that is outwards looking, that is pluralistic, and that is internally progressive. A second key lesson seemed to be the effectiveness of principled pragmatism. So Mr. Chauvinism is well known for his commitment to nonviolence, and um, Mr. Irondo already made reference to some of this. And the use of sort of collective protest, strikes, and defiance as a way of political action. In this, he really embraced Gandhian principles, which saw nonviolence not only as a moral ideal, but also as a political strategy. As a political strategy, nonviolent protest is important for building large collective movements. It can call attention and sympathy to a political cause, and it's really essential for sustaining long-term resistance. Of course, as we know, nonviolent protest doesn't always work. And I don't think this means that violent resistance is never permitted or justified, but Mr. Chubb and I have known following Gandhi would caution at least about the use of violence. Violence is a force that cannot be controlled once it is unleashed, and violence can easily be turned inwards to tear apart the very community that it's being used in defense of. So in short, nonviolence is, is an ideal, but I think it's also sometimes smart politics. And this reflects, I think, a more general pragmatism in Mr. Chaldonaikum's approach. He is famous for saying, a little now and more later. So he was pragmatic in the methods and institutions he aimed for, in how he thought, for example, self-determination could best be realized, but uncompromising in his commitments to Tamil and minority rights and to securing them in a principled way. So I think we often think that political ideals and political strategy are at loggerheads, that you have to sacrifice one for the other. And I think at least one of the lessons from Mr. Chauvinism's approach is that being principled and being seen to be principled can also be an effective political strategy. What also became clear reading some of these earlier speeches is, depressingly, how little has changed. In the 1940s and 50s, Tamils are worried about the seizure and colonization of Tamil lands. This is ongoing enthusiastically by the Sri Lankan military. Uh, when Gary Anandasundri was talking about the shocking disproportionate um, economic development and contribution, that's something that Mr. Chalanaga mentions in 1949. Um, in fact, we might think many things have become worse. Far from decentralizing power, which Mr. Chubb and I have installed through federalism, Sri Lanka has a unitary constitution with an executive presidency whose powers only seem to be expanding, even as its office holders use these powers to commit heinous human rights abuses and make genuinely disastrous and incompetent economic decisions. There is no accountability for human rights violations, including for war crimes committed in the final months of the war. In fact, the government has proposed a new anti-terrorism bill, allegedly to correct for the errors of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, but actually only compounds those flaws. It is a thinly veiled attempt 
I think it should be read as a thinly veiled attempt to quash all protests and strikes. It entrenches authoritarianism. As a Sri Lankan lawyer said, right now we have a de facto police state in Sri Lanka. With the passage of this bill, we will have a de jure police state in Sri Lanka. In this regard, what is happening in Sri Lanka can be understood as something that is happening globally, including um, a little too close to home for comfort. You have rising inequality and economic injustice, and what you have in response are states that are increasingly authoritarian, that target minority rights, are becoming less accountable for all of their citizens, and are really interested um, in finding ways to weaken democratic institutions and practices. So looking ahead, things might seem a little hopeless in Sri Lanka, and especially for its minority communities. And I think David and I have so far provided much inspiration. The power and corruption of the political elite seems unassailable, and the situation of people in the north and the east is desperate. And I think everyone here knows that too well. But I do want to end with two reasons for hope. The first, and maybe a bit more cautiously, is that the violence and venality of the Sri Lankan state is now being felt by Sri Lankans of all communities. For long, Tamils, Muslims, and other minorities face the brunt of the state's abuses. Now the state is targeting all dissidents, the poor, and workers. And the introduction of austerity measures under the island of Fela is only going to increase the suffering of ordinary people across the island. To be clear, I think there have always been progressive movements that were multi-ethnic and multi-religious and that were committed to minority rights throughout the war. Now, I think, there is the potential for broader support for structural reforms, such as decentralizing power, repealing authoritarian legislation that will also ultimately benefit minorities. What we see in Sri Lanka today is widespread opposition to the proposed anti-terrorism bill, which I should say is a genuinely terrible piece of legislation that is being proposed. Workers' strikes that the government has violently suppressed, and as we know, the resistance movements from last year um, that are still ongoing, although in slightly suppressed form. And we know that we have the longest running protests in the North, led by the mothers, wives, and children of the missing and disappeared, demanding answers about their loved ones. So here I think there's cautious reason for hope. These protest movements have different priorities. Uh, Sri Lanka always seems to be at a turning point, and then it doesn't actually turn. Um, but I think there is at least still the possibility to build broader coalitions. A second reason for hope that I'm a lot more confident about is the next generation of Tamil leaders, the Tamil youth. Just to be clear, I don't mean myself. I'm no longer a member of the Tamil youth, sadly. Um, so one of my best, the best parts of my job as a university professor is that I get to work with young people. And I do get to meet, uh, work with some Tamil students, not as many as the U of T is fortunate to get, but some Tamil students do make their way to Queens. Um, and I think that Tamil youth exemplify many of the principles that we most admire in leaders like Mr. Chalganaya. The Tamil students I have taught or worked with are proud of their Tamil identity and committed to Tamil rights, both here and in Sri Lanka. Like Mr. Chalganaya, they see Tamil liberation as tied up to the struggles of other groups. They see, for example, the Tamil resistance to colonization of Tamil lands in Sri Lanka also means that we must be committed to indigenous self-determination in Canada. They recognize that the fight for human rights is part of a global movement for minority rights and for anti-racism both here and abroad. And they also recognize that Tamil liberation has to be an inclusive liberation that includes gender equality, equality for queer Tamils, and justice for caste without Tamils. The motion that was recently passed by the TBSB to address caste oppression, which was introduced by Yamini Rajakosingam and Anushri Sandaraja, is I think a really powerful example of this sort of progressive leadership. Tamil liberation, both in Sri Lanka and in our new homes in Canada, is no easy task. But as Mr. Chalvin and I have said some years ago, we have no misgivings about the difficulty of the task ahead of us. The task must be done and can be done. That was true then, in 1949, and it is true now. In doing that task, we can learn a lot from the past and from our political elders, like Mr. Chalvin Aigam. But I would also urge us to look to our youth, for our future really lies with them. Thank you for your attention. Interactive portion of the evening. 
I'd like to welcome Ms. Maliha Wilson, who I don't believe is a stranger to anyone. You've been mentioned several times. I'm not sure I even need to introduce you. Uh, who will be moderating our Q&A today. Ms. Wilson is a lawyer from Toronto, Canada, and practices in the area of sanctions and international human rights. Maliha advocated on behalf of the Tamil diaspora community in Canada for the imposition of Magnitsky-type sanctions on Sri Lankan officials and has also advocated on behalf of Tamils at the UNHRC. Previously, Maliha served as the Assistant Deputy Attorney General Civil of the Government of Canada, of Ontario. She has litigated before the Supreme Court of Canada and the Ontario Court of Appeal in numerous leading cases. Thank you, and um, thank you all for being here and all the wonderful uh, comments uh, about my grandfather, Mr. Samoveda, that was very uh, touching, and thank you very much for your memories and sharing your memories. Um, so I, I, I will just start off the Q&A, and I hope there will be lots of questions and discussion, um, but since I'm moderating, I get to ask the first one. Um, so um, it was... Uh, I agree with you, Professor Cameron, about the concept of uh, federalism and that it's very difficult um, to conceptualize. Um, and uh, when I was at the ministry, uh, we would have to litigate on this and uh, just be, we had a little cheat. And that was the queen, right? So it would all come together, now we have the king, but it's not quite the same. But it would all come together. The concept of sovereignty would come together uh, in the person of the queen. Um, but uh, Sri Lanka doesn't have that uh, benefit and uh, uh, it, it is a difficult concept for people who have been used to, uh, it's a society that doesn't have, uh, he has not been sort of taught about the rule of law uh, to really come to grasp uh, with. But uh, the, I think what has changed now is the Tamil diaspora and the endless and tireless advocacy of the Tamil diaspora for human rights, human dignity, and uh, accountability. And this has been happening internationally. There have been sanctions, there have been UN resolutions. So does that, and maybe both of you can address this, does that change the political reality of Sri Lanka? Because until now, there was no countervailing force that agreed with you to get the government to move forward. Um, I think that has, I think that has potential. Um, and I think that the, because I, I, I think that you could, uh, if you engaged in imaginary <laughs> futures of the past, uh, bear with me, but you know, if you think at the time of decolonization um, or independence for Sri Lanka, if another course was follow had been followed, for example, if there had been respect for the Tamil language uh, and accommodation of that in some form in the public administration of the of the country, and possibly uh, uh, councils. You know, decentralized zones where the language patterns would be different uh, and uh, based on the people that needed to be served. Um, representation of minorities in the public institutions of the country appropriate to their size and number. That, that kind of uh, accommodation, I think, I, I suspect it would have gone a long way to uh, addressing the issues that ultimately boiled up in this wicked civil civil war and, and led also to aspirations like constitutional reform uh, and the introduction of uh, systems like federalism to try to find some way of, uh, of establishing zones of real authority that would protect the population's concern. So I, I think, you know, in a sense, what the question that you're raising, I think, potentially revisits some of these other issues that, and I hope opens the mind of people to different ways of understanding how you secure justice for not only individuals in the country, but 
for the minority groups and give them a place in that society. And I think uh, Ashwini's comments are, are leading us in that direction potentially as well. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, so I think a lot of child diaspora activism has been uh, crucial for uh, keeping, you know, the the attention of some international organizations and of using the U.S. processes in certain ways to just keep a record. Um, accountability. I don't know when that's going to happen, but you are going to have accountability without maintaining some sort of record. So I just think in terms of using what mechanisms international law provides. I do think the has been very active on that front. I think what's less clear to me, and I just don't know the answer to this, is when we start thinking about things like broad-based coalition building on the ground in Sri Lanka, I don't know, right? Um, I, I think there's, um, you know, there's a Colombo bubble, and then there's everyone else. So I think there are just a lot of, I think there's a lot of work that probably needs to be done with grassroots organizing, and there I just actually don't know how many people in the Tamil diaspora are even interested in doing that, right? Because I think justifiably and understandably, a lot of people are not really interested in improving civil society in Sri Lanka, right? Um, and so, so, so there I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I'll now uh, open it up uh, and uh, for questions. Uh, my question is, uh, my name is Chan Sivadavan. My question is to uh, Mr. Cameron. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, what is the role of the international community, if there's any, can be done to alleviate Tamil's uh, long-standing um, problems? Uh, number two, whatever happened to Sudan, uh, when it was under Al Bashir, the crimes against humanity, war crimes, and all those kinds of stuff were brought by the Indian health community, arm twisted, and that was able to free up the South Sudan for good. If the Indian health community can play such a role there, can it play a similar role in Sri Lanka? Well, the second one might be uh, best dealt with. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that might be what's best dealt with by Ashwini. Um, but I, I think the the role of the international community is is diverse, multiple, um, and you see one role that's being played now by the IMF uh, and the kind of supports that are being supplied with conditions to Sri Lanka to try to get it out of its economic difficulty. So I think there are many institutions and organizations that that have potentially a role to play. I think that there are you know there are some brutal brute geopolitical realities uh, that that are kind of that condition what happens internationally and, and one of those is how much the country matters to the international community. I mean, that's, that's a harsh thing to say, perhaps, but I, I do think that plays a, a role as, con as countries have a critical strategic importance for other major international actors. There'll be more interest in what's happening in that country and more potentially aid or direction or interference. Uh, but um, that I guess one, one role that has been played but you can judge with how much success ultimately uh, by the international community, and, and in this sense, particularly in Norway, um, has been aid and assistance um, in, in trying to find ways of supporting the various uh, <coughs> communities in Sri Lanka to find some resolution of the conflicts that they're confronting, not very successfully. So the, the Norwegians played a really critical role during the ceasefire. Um, and I think a very impressive one, commitment of resources, commitment of very senior people, on it, you know, day in, day out, trying to work this thing through. So if ever there was a kind of external commitment of that kind of support um, to actually both sides, uh, I, I saw that at that time in Sri Lanka. 
Um, and so it may have helped to achieve the ceasefire, but it did not ultimately, at least the problem was not resolved. And the, so the so organization that I was involved in, the Forum of Federations, played a, you know, a, a role as well in trying to provide some uh, uh, deeper understanding of multi-governance, you know, not necessarily a federal system, although potentially, but, but ways in which through government structures you could find means for the, the communities to uh, achieve a level of self-determination. So I think another, another role that doesn't seem to have uh, been exercised uh, very effectively yet, which touches more on, on Sudan, it is the kind of international justice component and the criminal court. And I think that, you know, I suspect if you look at that analytically across the globe and say, well, when has this instrument been actively used and pursued and when has it not, you'll find select selectivity. And you can ask yourself why that's so. But I think it's potentially very powerful. Um, it, it, even I remember Louise Arbour saying at one point when she was at the International Criminal Court, um, and, she, and she said, you know, the, the, um, these people may not be brought to justice today or tomorrow or the next week or even next year. But in effect, there's a warrant out for their arrest. And when they make a move, they will be picked up and they will be brought to justice. And in many cases, that was in the Yugoslavian context. In fact, they were. So I, I think it's, that's also got potentially key if the international community uh, is behind it. Sure. Um, I think I'm a lot more cynical about the ICC and why things happen at the ICC. I think either you have to be a state that what you know, powerful state would really care about, or you have to be a state that nobody cares about, and then maybe the do-gooders will get something done. I think the problem for Sri Lanka is that the West is really terrified that Sri Lanka is going to fall permanently into China's ambit. Uh, they also tend to really respect India, right? This is India's neighborhood. Narendra Modi isn't really going to be out to get uh, human rights accountability for leaders, right? So I just don't see that happening. Right? Which isn't to say that it isn't really worth collecting evidence um, and building up a case, because there will be a time when it is right to bring it, and then I think that's that's one thing. Um, but I think I don't think I mean I think frankly not enough powerful states care about what's happening in Sri Lanka. Um, but I don't think that's new either. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I think we have time for a couple more. Is there any? Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Rob. Oh, gosh, yes. uh, David, uh, Bob Ray was in politics. You were with the uh, form of federation. What made you get involved in this particular project? How did I get involved? Yes. Um, <coughs> Stephen Dion, remember Stephen Dion? Yes. At one point, he was intergovernmental affairs minister, uh, federal intergovernmental affairs minister. And he had a deputy called uh, George Anderson. And I think the two of them, Stefan uh, was a formerly an academic. Uh, and George has an academic temperament aside from him or dimension to him. And I think that they realized after you know all this long process of fighting secession in Canada that the federal government was in a very reactive position. It was always responding to whatever was coming out of the sovereignists in Quebec. And, uh, and it was the sovereignists in Quebec that decided if there'd be a referendum and when that referendum would be and what the trust it would be. And, and then, so they set the table and the federal government had to deal with it. And so they, they thought there should be much more substantial long-term discussion about federalism as a form of government because our debates were so local, and, and how many Quebecois in particular realized that there were you know, 26, 28 federations around the world that many, many 
society had decided to use that approach to governing themselves, and, and that it was celebrated by many people around the world as a, as a, a, a major civilized accomplishment to have to live in that kind of time. And so to, to uh, try to get that message across to Canadians, uh, they set up the Forum of Federations, and to get that to, to, to decide on that, they struck a committee. Ron Watts was the chair, uh, sorry, Bob Ray was the chair of the committee. I was a member of it, and Ron Watts was there as well. And the recommendation came to set up this Forum of Federations. And so that's how I got involved in the forum. And through the forum, uh, Bob and I got involved in Sri Lanka. So that, and the, just the final thing was that it was meant to be initially an organization that uh, brought federal countries, existing federal countries together. There was no such body. And so the idea was that they, they would learn from one another, share experience, and exchange civil servants, and so on. Uh, but very quickly, uh, the international community, the various aid and support agencies, um, began to call on the forum and say, you know, we are dealing with a conflict here, a post-conflict situation. We're trying to create a new constitution. And, and one of the options that's seriously being considered is federalism, and you guys have the expertise, we don't. So would you come and engage with this this community and provide advice and support. So very quickly it got drawn into that kind of aid and development and constitution making role which was not really in its initial conception. And that's remained a really important uh, and critical part of what the forum does. So I, I, I worked not just in Sri Lanka via this mechanism, but I, you know, I worked in Iraq and Somalia and other places, again, with the same kind of ethics. That's a long answer, I'm sorry. But no, no. Now you know. Would you go back again without using the next word? <laughs> because that's not, that's not mainstream. Go back to Sri Lanka? Yeah. I mean, it's the post conflict time. The same idea, but uh, use a different word there. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I've become. Uh, you know, looking at my my role, I, I found I found it was a an enormously interesting and gratifying experience in many many ways. But if I look back objectively and say, well, what has been the ben benefit and impact of this kind of effort for the societies I've dealt with? Iraq, Somalia, Sri Lanka. I had done a lot of work in Jerusalem on uh, on the Temple Mount as a as a kind of volcanic core of the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm totally responsible, but you know, my batting average is not very good. <laughs> so if I thought I could be helpful, yes. <laughs> Take the right position. Good. Last question. Thank you. My name is Sebastian Lebesch, and uh, I'll be here, especially with Sharon, I don't understand so much uh, Sharon and Tamil. Uh, particularly for upcountry farmers. I'm also from Central Province, from Norway. And uh, even uh, like Mr. Gary said, it's been 200 years, uh, they left India and been there for Sri Lanka 200 years. And they contributed so much for the economy. And still, I would say they're modern slavery. If you look at Central Province, highest child labor, school dropout, malnutrition, uh, suicide, all kind of problems going on. They don't even have an address in their estates. No house number, nothing, right? I was there last year, almost nine months, helping the community. And anything that their uh, issues never been spoken. Only nowadays, kind of uh, internationally, people are talking about it since the 200 years of migration, right? And not only that, even uh, I was in uh, India, a refugee camp last year. And I see so many refugees, and we are lucky came to Canada, we got the privilege for the privileges. But who that Sri Lanka as a refugee in India, they're still refugees. They are still in the camp, no citizenship. They are just like today, they're still there, right? So that's one of the issues that we need to speak about it. And also the GSA community in Sri Lanka, they really desperately need help and attention. They're so charged, not even a single piece of land they want it. 
they are on, uh, uh, they contribute so much. They build the uh, railway tracks and the roads, build the TST transition, so much GDP, they brought so much income to the country, and they've been forgotten. And thank you for the option. At least I had an option to speak on behalf of uh, our country. by maybe sort of pointing both of you in a slightly more optimistic uh, uh, way. Um, you know, the big, and Gary actually has been a big part of this. Uh, we would never have thought that we would, that we would get so many uh, resolutions out of the UNHRC um, calling into account uh, various Sri Lankan governments for uh, their lack of uh, human rights, uh, or lack of respect for human rights. Um, we, the, currently the UNHRC is compiling a record of um, uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes and so on. Um, uh, there have been sanctions uh, issued against uh, Sri Lankan officials. Um, at some stage, the Sri Lankan uh, leadership, or the, the leadership of the South, uh, certainly they've been named and shaped, but you know, if you want to function in the modern world, it is now expected that you respect human rights and democracy and rule of law and principles such as this. So th there's a clear choice. I think it's what Gary said, it's, uh, we are facing a new uh, set of circumstances and there is a clear choice as to whether you want, they want to be part of the modern world with uh, with the enrichment that it brings or carry on in the same way that just the entire population gets uh, affected negatively by uh, carrying on in the same way. So um, it's a clear choice. There's things happening internationally. Who knows where it will go? But uh, uh, I did want to leave people with a slightly more optimistic uh, view. But uh, in, in the process, I want to thank both of you so much for contributing. for sharing their knowledge and insights with us. Um, on a very personal level, um, I've had the privilege of getting to know the Tamil community through the Tamil chair over the last four years. And honestly and truly, I could have sat and listened to you both for the whole evening. I learned so much, and I'm deeply grateful to you both. Um, I would also like to thank Olanko for leading the organization of this evening and giving us this opportunity to join in celebration. We're lucky at UTSC to count to you as one of our friends. And finally, <laughs> on behalf of myself and my colleagues, I'd like to wish you all a happy Tamil New Year one day early. <laughs> May this year bring an abundance of joy, success, love, and prosperity to you and your family. Safe travels as you head home, and good night, everyone. Thank you.